Okay, I think it's on. So we are studying the Bhagavad Gita. We are on the third chapter towards the very end. Arjuna asked this question that why is it, what is it that is within us makes us do um, wrong things? Uh, things which we, even if we do not want to do something wrong and yet we end up doing uh, things which are unethical or immoral. We cannot control ourselves. It is also the great obstacle to spiritual life. After all, what is it that prevents us from meditating peacefully? What is it that prevents us from doing unselfish work, doing work for the sake of others? What is it that prevents us from loving God? Um, so, and realizing ourselves as beyond body and mind, as the Atman. All the yogas had this one problem. This one obstacle. What is that? And um, Sri Krishna answers that it is desire. Notice that it is the same answer given by the Buddha. There is suffering in the world. That's the first noble truth. And the second noble truth is the cause of suffering is desire. Sri Krishna says, Kama esha krodha esha rajaguna samudbhava. Desire and anger. But basically desire because we saw that anger is nothing but frustrated desire. So desire, passion, lust, this is the uh, major fundamental obstruction. Now in the conclusion of the third chapter, Sri Krishna is going to talk about the um, ways to deal with this. How does one overcome this great enemy of spiritual life in the last few verses? So we are going to do verse number 40. I think we are done up to verse 39 last time. Yes. Verse number 40. The background to this uh, verse number 40 is this. So now that we have decided we are going to be spiritual, we have to overcome the problem of desire. Um, nothing wrong with desire as such, but because it controls us rather than we controlling it, because it's an obstruction to a peaceful life in the world and to spiritual realization. That is, that is the problem with desire. So why, uh, so how do you control desire? How do you, how does one overcome this pr enemy? Now, to overcome any enemy, to defeat any enemy, you must know where the enemy is. Uh, so when, for example, this beautiful city of New York was attacked and uh, finally, you know, everybody wanted to know who attacked and they finally discovered that it was Bin Laden. Now, it is like that. We are having serious problems in life. So, we, Arjun asks this question, what is the source of this problem? Kama, desire. Now, the next step is, where is this enemy, Bin Laden, hiding? You cannot defeat the enemy without finding out the enemy. So, that took so many years. And a long time later, it was found out. It was hiding in some place in Pakistan. And then only the uh, American forces were able to find him and kill the enemy. Exactly like this, we must find out where this enemy in spiritual life, where is it exactly? What is the base of this enemy? What is the hideout? And so that is what Krishna is going to say. Where is desire? Verse number 40. Indriyani mano buddhi asya dheshthana mujyate the abode of the hide, hideout of uh, desire. The abode of desire is said to be the senses, indriyani, manaha, mind, and buddhi, intellect. In these, this desire obscures knowledge and deludes the, the sentient being, the jiva. Dehinam means the one who is embodied, one who is in this body and mind, us. We are deluded, we are trapped by desire. Which, where does it, where has desire hidden? Where is it, where is the base of desire? The senses, the sensory system, the mind and the uh, buddhi. Now the first interesting observation here is, we normally think desire is something mental. Here Krishna says, no, no, no. Desire pervades the entire internal instrument. Internal instru instrument, subtle body, sukshma sharira. There is one part of the sukshma sharira which is called antah karana, inner instrument. So, is there an outer instrument? Yes. The senses are called the outer instrument, bahir karana. That means the instruments which are actually within us, 
but they contact the external world. So the eyes are in touch with external world, they can see the form. Ears are in touch with external world, they can hear sound. And similarly, sense of taste, sense of smell, sense of touch, they're in contact with the external world. So external, uh, the sense organs are in contact with the external world. That's why they are called external instruments. External means they are within us, but they contact the external world. But compared to that, the mind, our thoughts, our feelings, emotions, ideas, memory, they are internal. They are not directly in contact with the external world. The sense organs get information from the world outside and they present it to the mind. They present it to the mind and the intellect. They uh, store that information in the memory. But memory, mind, intellect, these are called inner instrument, antahkarana, not external. Because they are not directly in contact with the external world. So, Sri Krishna says, desire is not just in the uh, inner instrument, not just in the mind. It is there in the senses also. Our idea might be that the senses are innocent. And they are just like a, um, you know, like the lenses of a microscope or telescope, which are showing us what is there. Uh, senses are, are neutral, innocent. No, they are not. Desire is very much there. The senses have an autonomy, an autonomous intelligence to them. And desire stays, uh, here, uh, has its location, has its base. The first base of desire is in the senses, in the sensory system. A lot of energy flows through this, these senses and uh, unless they are controlled and channelized, it's desire which will take over. I have mentioned this earlier, the um, American psychologist Jonathan Haidt, uh, H-A-I-D-T, his book The Happiness Hypothesis, where he mentions, he, he takes up the problem of why is it so difficult to change? Why is it so difficult to, we know so many things, but why is it so difficult to do these things? The same problem which Duryodhana had, uh, that I know what is right, but I don't feel like doing it. I know what is wrong, but I can't stop myself. There is some power within me which forces me to do it. Janami dharmam nachame pravritti, janami adharmam nachame nivritti, kenapi devena hridhisthite na yatha niyojito asmi tatha karomi, some power. Not always. Sometimes I am able to control myself, but sometimes not able to control myself. I do things, I say things or think things by the body, speech and mind, which later I regret. I know it is wrong. So what is that power? Even Arjuna has the same problem. But remember, the big difference between Arjuna and Duryodhana is Duryodhana is not interested in changing. He did not ask Krishna, so what can I do about it? But Arjuna is asking. This. Yoga and Vedanta which you are teaching me is all very good, but uh, uh, one big problem is even after knowing these things, I really cannot do it so well. So why? What is the problem in this? Why is it difficult to lead a holy life, a spiritual life? Um, so Jonathan Haidt has taken up the same problem. He says there is such a lot of literature nowadays, self-help literature. You go to Barnes and Noble, now you cannot go now because it is all pandemic, but you will see whole shelves are full of self-help literature, seven, highly, uh, sorry, seven habits of highly effective people. Huh? And, and here in the West, if one book is successful, immediately some sequels will be written. So seven habits of highly effective people, because it sold so much immediately, eighth habit came out. Uh, but all these books are there uh, and they are helpful. They are inspiring, they are good. But with so much information, so much inspiration, why aren't the lives of people changing? I mean, if it's just a few of those books, if we are able to implement them in our life, our life would be totally different. Huh? But why is it so difficult? So Jonathan Haidt took it up and uh, his answer, I have discussed it earlier with you also. His answer is exactly what Sri Krishna says, that um, we are not totally in charge. There is this, in the body-mind system, there is a certain degree of autonomy. Um, there is a certain amount of inertia, a certain amount of independence in our body-mind system, in the sensory system, which go their own way. The example, very nice example he gave was the elephant and the rider, the mahut. Uh, I have given this example also earlier. So, the mahut knows where he wants to go and he directs the elephant and the elephant will go take him there. But, 
if the elephant decides not to obey, if an elephant sees a banana on the way and the elephant thinks I will like, I want to eat those bananas and he goes that way, um, or as the Americans would say that if the elephant goes bananas, <laughs> then then there's very little that the mahout can do, very little that the rider can do because the elephant is much stronger. There's no way that the rider can force the elephant to go uh, the way he wants to go. Similarly, the case with us. So the intellect, the buddhi is very impressed uh, when you go to um, seminar or webinar these days or uh, you know, self-improvement courses. You pay hundreds of dollars and, you should, uh, and they promise you a wonderful life if you follow these things. But the fine print is if you follow. And the problem is if you follow means who will follow? We decide the intellect is very impressed by these things and the intellect decides these are all wonderful things. I will get up early in the morning, I will do meditation, I will do yoga, daily I will uh, study something. Uh, Warren Buffet, he, he says in one place, the in big investor, uh, so investment manager. So he says in one place that the secret to his success is he reads 500 pages per day. That means like two big books I think. <laughs> uh, and this is 80% of his working hours are spent in reading. And he says, this is something that anybody, he says, anybody can do. He says, any of you can do this. But then he adds, very wise man, he says, I know you will not do it. So why not? We, I feel I, I will be able to do all that. So I make this program, make this schedule. I will follow this from tomorrow. My life will be different. Yes, if you follow it, your life will be different. But what happens next morning when your time, first thing is to wake up early in the morning. Instead of uh, 7 o'clock, you wake up at 5 o'clock, suppose. And the alarm goes off. The buddhi says, good, time to get up. The body says, no. Did you ask me before making your big schedule? Uh, all the information, big ideas from seminar and webinar and Vedanta class, all for buddhi. Body said, I never signed up for it. It is cold. I am tired. I am sleepy. I would rather like to sleep here. You go and do your yoga exercise, tells the intellect. I will sleep under in the bed. Now, the body is like the elephant. Uh, not only the body, emotions, sense organs, they are like the elephant. They do not respond to bright ideas, the latest books, bestsellers on the um, Barnes and Noble's bookshelf or webinars, seminars or Vedanta classes, no. So the body has its own intelligence. Now they say, for example, the gut, they say the gut has its own intelligence. And there are certain parts of our body where there are concentrations of nerve endings. So these sensory, the sensory system has its own autonomy, own intelligence. Just by the way, what does Haidt recommend then? He says, how does the elephant learn? The mouth can learn by reading a book or reading the map, the mouth knows where to go. Similarly, buddhi can learn by attending seminars, Vedanta class and reading books, Gita class. But how will the elephant be trained? How will the elephant learn? How will the body will learn? How can we bring the body, the sensory system under control? And that is possible only by training. Have you noticed how the elephant is trained? Not by giving lectures to the elephant. And not by giving handout and downloads and uh, seminars to the elephant. Elephant is trained. So the same thing has to be repeated and it becomes a habit. Similarly, the sensory system has to be disciplined and trained. It will come now. So Krishna says here, now we talk about self-management. This is the core idea of self-management. Self-management at the level of senses, mind and intellect. So the senses, they have a certain tendencies inbuilt within them. Our genetic makeup itself. So there are certain things that the eyes want to see. They are designed in a light. They, there is a certain tendency, a certain inclination about seeing certain things. It is because of the genetic makeup of our bodies. It's because of our conditioning in this life and also conditioning in many lives, some scars in many lives. So likes and dislikes start at the level of the senses themselves. There are certain foods, clearly tongue especially, certain foods that we like to eat. Not that it's something very particularly great about that food because that same food at different times, we may want to eat, we may not want to eat. Different people have different tastes, different uh, uh, places, different cultures have different tastes also. So it's not the food itself. It is the conditioning, the training in our sensory system. Um, uh, so also from past lives. All of this 
makes the senses present things as nice, nice, attractive, attractive. Once the sense is focused, you're seeing something, hearing something that you want to hear. And e equally, there is some uh, resistance also, things which we do not like. Dvesha, Raga Dvesha, at the level of senses. This is the first important insight which Krishna is giving here. We think that desire is something in the mind. No, desire starts at the level of the senses. Um, senses have very powerful uh, energies flowing through them and they have particular channels which um, are already made in each of our cases by our past conditioning, our genetic makeup, our uh, vasanas in this life and past life. So, the next level is at the mind. So, in this system, the mind is like the, like the inner instrument. So, all the senses, they gather data from outside and they present it to the mind. The mind has the job of uh, collecting and coordinating this data, considering alternatives uh, and controlling the senses. Now, when the mind, the senses dump this information in the mind, I like, I like, I like, the mind then takes a decision, the mind then gets this uh, desire, I want, this is good, this comes at the level of the mind, uh, should I or should I not, uh, I sh uh, should, this kind of feeling that it's attraction, it is nice, uh, this comes at the level of the mind um, and the faculty of control is lost. The mind is supposed to control and coordinate the senses, but now what happens is, like a horse out of control, it drags the mind. The senses drag the mind. The mind is supposed to control. The senses now drag the mind, like a horse pulling the mind, uh, pulling the rider in a particular direction. That funny example of the man very seriously galloping through the village in his horse, and somebody asks him, Sir, where are you going in such a hurry and with such a serious expression? And the man looks back shouting, I don't know, ask the horse. So the horse is taking away the man in some direction. Our senses are like that. Uh, eyes are pulling in one direction, uh, the tongue in a direction, ears and touch and smell, different directions. Whatever is attractive to the senses, the mind is being pulled in those directions and unable to control. So the mind is unable to control. That is at the level of the mind. San the definition is Sankalpa Vikalpa Atmakam Manaha. Mind is the one which considers pros and cons. Various options arise in the mind after taking information from the senses. Then the desire infects, so at the level of senses, attraction or repulsion. And uh, desire is the form of attraction, so let's stay with that attraction. At the level of senses, attraction, powerful attraction, habitual attraction. Um, then it comes to the level of the mind. What does this um, desire do at the level of the mind? The function of the mind is to control, that function is lost. It's, it overrides that function. And then it goes to the level of the intellect. The same desire, at, at the level of the intellect, buddhi. What does it do? The buddhi definition is nishchayatmika buddhi. Nishchayatmika antakkarana vritti buddhi. What does it mean? Intellect is that modification of the inner instrument which takes a decision, which gives clarity. Understanding, decision, all of that is at the level of buddhi. Nishchaya atmika, definiteness. Now, in the case of this person where the sensory system is overriding, sensory system is completely flowing out uncontrolled way to the object of desire, uh, something to eat, see, watch, whatever, hear, um, and the mind has lost its faculty of control. Then what happens to the intellect? The intellect which has all this information, it becomes overpowered. It now joins. They say that if you can't, can't beat them, join them. If you can't beat them, join them. Yes. So, the intellect now joins it. And intellect says, yes, it's good. We should do it. We should do this. We should see that. We should touch this. We should eat that. Um, they say there is this psychology of addiction. Psychology of addiction. People who get addicted, drugs, drink, whatever, the senses are very powerful. They are habituated to uh, ingesting that, that particular drug. They want those sensations. And the mind has completely lost control over the senses. So, same desire. And what does the buddhi do? The buddhi which very well knows what is addiction, what, is, what are the bad consequences, and the financial problems, all these problems which are coming out of addiction, 
all these things that the buddhi knows uh, is is it all uh, muted or somebody's um yeah there's some background noise coming yeah. We are able to unmute ourselves. Yeah, so, right. So, uh, I hope if, Jayant will take a look. If you find somebody not uh, muted, you can mute. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Now, the uh, in the case of the buddhi, what happens is, uh, the, in, the ca in the case of the, this addiction, the sense organs, um, they are pushing you toward the, the addict towards repeating that addictive behavior, it's drugs or uh, alcohol or whatever it is, the mind has lost control and the intellect which understands all of this, but the intellect is deluded, he says vimohayati, uh, it is del it delude, it's deluded, the intellect is deluded, deluded in what sense? Um, the addict will say, oh just one more time, it is alright, I am fully in control, that one more time that the addict has repeated so many times maybe drugs or whatever it is, but it, it genuinely feels, no, no, I am not out of control, I can control this. They say that those who are uh, counsellors and all, they say that this is a sign of uh, addiction. You, the person actually thinks that I can, the person actually thinks that I can control it, but cannot control. If you actually see the person's life, the person cannot control. The intellect is deluded, vimohayati. Um, all the information in the intellect is now not working, has read the Gita, has attended seminars and self-improvement, read many, many books, purchased self-help books, uh, positive psychology, so many things, but not working. Um, sense organs, overwhelmed by desire, mind lo loses control, intellect confused. At the moment of decision, intellect gets confused. Um, yes, this is number 40. Then, what should we do? So, 41, 42 and 43, uh, Sri Krishna gives us, um, now that we have identified the enemy, desire, where is the enemy? Uh, in the level of senses, at the level of mind, at the level of intellect. Now, what do we do? At the level of senses, mind and intellect. 41. Tasmatvam indriyanyado Niyamya bharatar shabha Paapmanam prajahi yenam Jnana vijjana nashanam Therefore, O mighty prince, first control the senses, giving up this wicked craving that destroys knowledge and realization. Tasmat, therefore. Therefore means, because this is the situation, the desire exists at the level of senses, desire exists at the level of mind, and at the level of intellect. Now, what do you do? He says, in, again, important insight by Sri Krishna. Sadhana starts from outward and then inwards. He says, first control the senses. First bring the dis uh, senses under discipline. We often, we, we may think, so if the mind is pure, then what does it matter what you are seeing or hearing internally if you are controlled externally one can uh, it, it's not so important what what one does no the secret of sadhana is though it is true ultimately it is all about the mind and about uh, your inner instrument what is inside that is the more important thing than what you do outside what one eats outside um, what one wears outside uh, whether one shaves the head or keeps hair, these are all external things. And they are not really connected to spirituality. But here is the great insight of Sri Krishna that um, sadhana must begin from the gross to the subtle, from the physical to the mental to the intellectual, from the external to the internal. And this is one insight. If you do not control the sensory system at first, and we do not control the mind. Uh, let the senses do what they want. I can see whatever I want. I can smell, taste, touch, whatever I want. Eat whatever I want. Whatever desire is coming, I can fulfill it. And at the level of mind, I, I do not exercise control. And then, if I say that only the thing is, I am Atman, that's the important thing. At the level of intellect, I have understood that I am Brahman, I am Atman. It will not work. Uh, then the result will be, 
one may have understood Vedanta, but result will be again and again, we will get into trouble and we will suffer and say that, why is this happening to me? I am unable to find peace, I am unable to find um, joy in life. So the starting has to be at the level of the senses. Tasmatvam Adho, beginning of spiritual life is, or beginning of sadhana is starting with a discipline of the senses. So the senses have to be brought under control, niyamya. Control means, um, we say this Lakshman Rekha. Lakshman Rekha is the, is the line which is drawn around. Beyond this you will not go. So my discipline is, what will I see, what will I not see? Uh, what will I hear, what will I not hear? Uh, what will I taste, what will I eat, what will I not eat? A discipline. Um, so there are so many interesting stories. So this is a, the, in, at the initial level of spiritual life, these things have to be there. This, this uh, external uh, protection. Sri Ramakrishna used to give a very nice example. When you plant a little sapling, you would put a little fence around it. Otherwise, he says, goats and cows will come and eat it. In, uh, on the roadside in India, if you plant some little saplings, you have to protect it. Otherwise, goats and cows will come and eat it. But when that tree, when it has grown into a big banyan tree, you don't need that, that fence. You can remove it and it's so strong, you can tie an elephant to it. Sri Ramakrishna says, nothing will happen. So similarly, at the beginning of spiritual life, a fence of some rules and regulations, some discipline. And this discipline of the senses is necessary. Um, I, I remember that, uh, so it is a rule when we join the order that uh, you have to fast on um, the um, Ekadashi days. So it's a rule for one year or for three years, it's there. And after that, if those who want to follow, they can follow. But if you don't want to, that's all right. So all the novices, brahmacharis, we uh, would fast. Now the thing is, you don't know when the Ekadashi will be. So, so there are certain days like the birthdays of the disciples of Sri Ramakrishna, when there is in, in the main monastery, there will be nice food will be there. Some extra, uh, instead of just uh, rice, there will be also be like puri, you know, luchi. So that will, will be there. Sweets will be there. So these things will be there. They are very attractive to young people. Um, one day what happened was, the Ekadashi was on the birthday of Swami Shivananda. And that day a lot of nice food is prepared. And uh, so the brahmacharis, they went in a group to this uh, senior monk there and said, Swami, can we do the Ekadashi tomorrow? Today we <laughs> can we sort of postpone the Ekadashi? <laughs> and he snapped, either do it today or don't do it at all. Now the thing is, that is the thing. Uh, when a challenge comes, the, it's easy to follow the rule when there's no problem. When there's a challenge and there's a temptation, then can you follow the rule. Then that rule has a benefit. That is the control of the senses. Um, Swami Bhuteshanji used to tell us that uh, the sadhus in Uttarakhand, they have a saying about food because they go for begging. So you don't know what kind of food you will get. It could be good, it could be average or nothing, maybe some, day, some days nothing. So there's a saying they have in Hindi among the sadhus. Um, kabhi ghi ghana to kabhi mutthi bhar chana aur kabhi wo bhi mana so kabhi ghi ghana that means sometimes you get good food with ghi that is delicious food in bhiksha sometimes nothing just a, a handful of a gram mutthi bhar chana so a handful of gram that's all you get or sometimes nothing at all or kabhi wo bhi mana and you must be absolutely equal in all these three so that, that is again the control of the senses. Tasmatvam indriyani adav niyamya bharatar shava. What do you do then? First fight this uh, enemy of desire at the level of the senses. Papmanam prajahi enam. Give up this desire. He is calling it pap, papmanam. This is the one which is productive of sinful activity because of this desire at the level of senses. And it destroys jnana, vijnana, nashanam. It destroys knowledge and realization. So what jnana and what is vijnana? Jnana is, Shastra, uh, Shankaracharya says, um, so, jnanam uh, shastrata acharyatascha. So, atma uh, adinam avabodha. So the knowledge that we get from the text and from the teacher, that is jnana. So we are st studying the Bhagavad Gita with the teacher and what we understand from that, that is jnana. That is lost when the Indriyas 
when you know desire shines the desire is in charge of the indriyas and those things are we we lose sight of that vigyanam he says anubhava realization of that that realization will not happen though i am um, studying i'm trying to understand i'm trying to meditate and do my bhakti practices all of these i'm trying to do but if once in a while i i break the discipline of the senses what will happen is that realization that these practices will deepen into realization i will realize that i am not the body and mind that realization will not flash or even if it does flash he says vigyana nashanam even if it does flash it will not be stable it will be lost um that is why this con- constant control of the senses is necessary um again this example i have given earlier one sadhu in uttarakhand um a, a devotee came to him talking about he had a kidney transplant and so uh, this sadhu did not know much, much about modern medicine so he asked so are you all right now and the devotee said that yes but i have to take these uh, medicines and uh, i have to follow strict diet and routine so this sadhu was surprised he said but you have already operation is done you have got a new kid- kidney now why do you have to do these things the devotee said the doctor explained to me that if i do not do it then what will happen is the the my body will uh, not accept this kidney as part of the body it will not be integrated in system it the kidney will not start functioning giving the benefit and finally the body itself will reject the kidney as a foreign body Uh, you know the immunity system will reject it as a foreign body and it will die whole thing will be a failure and even life threatening also this hadu was very excited we were there so he was uh, telling us that see this is how ah uh, mahatma ji de yahi to hai baat this is the thing mahatma ji you have to do in sadhana when you understand certain things when you have got certain amount of understanding of vedanta sadhana must increase so you the knowledge which you have got it has to be protected more meditation more japa more strict life devotion all this bhakti yoga um, dhyana yoga karma yoga all these things protection must be there for that knowledge otherwise what will happen is the knowledge will not be integrated into your life you will not be able to assimilate that knowledge then exactly like that new kidney then what will happen it will not give its benefit that the joy and peace you want from vedanta dukkha nivritti overcoming of suffering and ananda prapti attainment of bliss it will not come and finally what will happen that knowledge which will be isolated by the rest of the body mind system will be destroyed also just like that kidney will be rejected so to assimilate that knowledge to transform it into jivan mukti into realization which is stable in the language of bhagavad gita sthita pragya for getting that uh, one must do these uh, uh, disciplines especially control of the senses before i go into the 42nd verse which is most important shall we deal with uh, questions uh, any comments uh, yes ma'am there is one question in chat yes actually two um from ramya yeah if desire is primarily in the senses how come it gets transmitted from birth to birth with the sukshma sukshma sharira are the yeah. senses in the stula sharira yes so senses are not all fully in the stula sharira remember only the physical part of the senses are in the stula sharira the powers of the senses and the vasanas associated with them are definitely in the um, uh, sukshma sharira so they get transmitted from lifetime to lifetime as the physical body falls apart this this body goes the subtle body goes to other life lives other bodies and it carries the vasanas and depending on the karma which is activated from lifetime to lifetime um uh, those uh, those vasanas those desires will again become active at the level of the senses i think rick is saying translate the sanskrit terms you are right um so somebody should flag it sanskrit i remember when i started these classes in hollywood there would be this gentleman who would sit an american gentleman sit at the back and uh, Uh, he would once in a while if i forgot to translate any sanskrit term he would raise his hand and say too much sanskrit too much. so i have to translate these things yes say is anything that you don't follow please uh, just remind me to translate sukshma sharira subtle body 
Stola Sharira, physical body. So the question was, if you are saying desire is at the uh, level of, uh, desire is at the level of the senses, so when the body dies, when a person dies, the physical body is obviously dead. And so your eyes and um, uh, you know the auditory system, the olfactory system, they're all, all dead. They're phys- basically the body is destroyed. So if the desire is there somehow encoded in them, the desire also will go. Why should it go to the next life? Uh, no. My answer was, the senses function not only in the physical level, but actually at the subtle level. They are part of the subtle body. These are powers of the subtle body. And the conditioning is there at the level of the subtle body. Yeah. Yes. Uh, uh, Ramji, you are next. Yeah, Mrs. Swamiji in chapter 2, Bhagavan says, Vashehi yasya indriyani ta pragya pratishti sa. Yes. So, until we realize the ultimate, the traces of desire will remain in our mind. And without the control of our senses, we cannot realize the ultimate. So, how do we get out of this, like, vicious circle? Yes, very good question. Uh, yes, uh, the question Poonamji has, has raised is that in uh, the second chapter when Arjuna asked about the nature of the enlightened person, Sthita Pragya, the one whose wisdom is, is settled, that's another term for Jivan Mukta, free while living, a fully enlightened being. Uh, Krishna says uh, that one whose senses are under control that wisdom of that one becomes stable, the realization of that one becomes stable. Now, her question is that um, without control of the senses, you cannot attain enlightenment. Um, And without full enlightenment, you cannot control the senses. It leads to a vicious circle. Uh, How will you attain enlightenment? Without enlightenment, full full control of the senses is not possible. And without uh, full control of the senses, enlightenment is not possible. One interesting uh, answer here, uh, this exact question is raised by Ramanu Jacharya, the great master of Vishishtadvaita Vedanta. In his Bhagavad Gita commentary, he uses this. He says, this is a vicious circle, exactly like he said. It's a vicious circle that control of the senses is absolutely necessary for enlightenment. And enlightenment is actually necessary for control of the senses, for perfect control of the senses. Uh, Then how do you get enlightenment at all? And he says, this is where bhakti is useful. Ramanuja's insight. Bhakti, devotion to, suppose devotion to Krishna, um, to, to whichever deity is beloved to you. The devotion there, what happens is, the uh, devotion is of the nature of desire. This Desire and devotion have the same force. The same force which flows out towards the world and says, I want th- these things. I want to see this, taste this, touch that. Hear this, smell that. Uh, so the desire which flows out, energies which flows out through the senses, that alone is uh, channelized towards God. Instead of I, the same I want, instead of I want the world, it becomes I want God. Uh, it is channelized towards um, uh, God realization. Um, now, Bhakti does that very well. Bhakti is of the nature of love. So when one loves, I love the Lord. That is, that is my, uh, uh, that is the pull of the heart. Then that same love which was flowing out towards the world as desire is now channeled towards God, to, towards the form uh, and the name of the deity, Ishta Devata, the chosen ideal, the chosen deity. Especially if you are in, in, initiated into a mantra, this is very useful. So that's the path of uh, devotion. So that, uh, Ramanuja takes that occasion to introduce the importance of devotion. Um, one teacher of Jnana, um, of the Advaita path, uh, in Uttarakhand, he says, I think I read, I did not hear it, I, I uh, read it. Um, uh, he was asked, which is greater, Bhakti or Jnana? And he replied, Bhakti badi hai, bhakti is greater. So people were surprised that um, uh, how is this person, this Swami who is a great non-dualist saying that bhakti is greater. He said, so if bhakti is greater, then bhakti means devotion. Devotion is greater, then what about knowledge? And he immediately replied, in knowledge there is no greater or lesser. There is no higher or lower. Gyan mein badi cho- bada chota nahi hota hai. But then he explained later on, what happens is, 
this is at the, at the beginning in, in this level of sadhana, spiritual practice. At the level of spiritual practice, what happens is this. Um, we may, and I'm talking about Advaita Vedanta, Vedanta. So we may study Vedanta, understand these things, and we will see what is to be understood in the next verse itself. Um, but that is at the level of the intellect. The intellect begins to understand and appreciate it. The clarity comes to the intellect. But if the mind and the senses are not purified yet, the desire still remains there. And it pulls us continuously out towards the world. And there all the problems will remain. Uh, desire and anger and greed, these things, uh, they rule. Maybe at the level of a sadhaka, it may be very controlled. It may be in the finer form, but it's still there. Um, I remember this Swami, who was a very great, a wonderful Swami, a great teacher of Vedanta, but uh, he had a hot temper and uh, he would lose his temper and yell at people. And then somebody asked him, but Swami, you are the Atman, why do you get angry? And he said, oh, don't you know, uh, I am the Atman, I am very clear about that. This desire is at the level, this anger is at the level of the mind. I am a witness of that anger. Uh, you may say that, you may even mean it, but it's not a very good, good thing. Uh, it's not a very inspiring sight. And that sadhu, uh, he said, Rota wa jnani kisko pasand hai? The, the jnani, the, the man of knowledge, uh, who is weeping. Weeping means, um, you know, I am troubled by desire or anger or greed. This kind of a grumbling, complaining, unhappy jnani, it's not an inspiring sight. So, the senses have to be controlled at the very beginning. Bhakti is very useful there. Um, suppose you say, but without bhakti is it not possible? It, it is possible. It's more difficult. Remember, it's not really a vicious circle. All it means is an effort has to be made for the control of the senses. It's not that the senses cannot be controlled without perfect enlightenment. Everybody controls the senses. All of us do. To raise a family, to hold on to a job, uh, you must control your senses to some extent at least. To complete your PhD, whatever it is. To some, to some extent a discipline is necessary and we do control. From childhood onwards, we are taught to control our senses. If we do not control the senses, let alone sadhana, one cannot succeed in worldly life also. Okay, this much. Um, Alright, anybody else? Uh, there are two more. Um, yes. Shekhar, next. Pranam Swami Ji, Namaskar. I have a different flavor of Poonam Ji's question. Yes. Uh, buddhi is the faculty that's responsible to control the senses. Hmm. Then uh, mind, control mind controls the senses. Buddhi takes the decision. Right. So buddhi controls the mind and mind controls the senses. Yes. Hmm. So ultimately, if my buddhi is uh, weak and that's why my senses are running. Yes. So is it like a fox guarding the hen house? Should yes. I be first strengthening my buddhi? Uh, Yes, you are right. It's because the uh, lack of clarity in the buddhi. But what Krishna pointed out in verse number 41 is that um, the process has to begin by shutting the um, door. Before you take care of this, so you don't you want continuously fox to enter every day into the hen house. So at the level of the eyes and ears, and, so there must be a discipline at the sensory level. Stomach is upset. Yes, I need to put medicine and diet to clear, uh, to clear the stomach. But to do that, first of all, I need to control my intake. No amount of medicine uh, will work if I keep on stuffing myself. Similarly, no amount of um, clarity, meditation, uh, Vedantic thinking will work if I continuously engage myself in, um, you know, uh, in, in uh, sensory uh, addiction. That means continuously engaged in pursuing, say, pleasure, for example. There will be neither time nor knowledge, and neither time nor energy. And what we read and understand also will be quickly overpowered if the control is not there. So the control should start at the external, at the, at the uh, grossest level, at the physical level, starting with the senses, then mind and then buddhi. Yes, we can continue to study and think at the level of buddhi. That is what I started with at first, that we always think, and it is true, the real spirituality is internal. It should be at the level of buddhi and manas, mind and uh, intellect. 
that is very true but it will not work until the the gates of the city have been controlled yes so does that mean is the mind autonomous uh, from uh, manas and buddhi Ma- manas is mind right so is the uh, mind autonomous of uh, buddhi intellect so mind may, 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 yes so all of these are autonomous they as as we discussed earlier they have their uh, little degree of uh, autonomy the senses themselves have an inbuilt intelligence to them uh, mind has its own autonomy and the buddhi also of course definitely it is uh, auto- autonomous and so they can they can pull in different directions and we feel that we feel pulled the nature of desire is this i do not want to say i'm pulled by this cookie and i know that i should not eat it's it's of no use it's just a level of the of the tongue which wants to have a nice taste and so i understand it's of no importance it's um, it's not good for my health so i will not eat this is one pull intellect is saying and the tongue is saying it's nice i want it and this pull is there this is the nature of desire this is the problem same person at one level we do not we want to control it and we want to overcome it we are very clear about it at the other level we want it also i don't want to do it and i want to do it together this is the uh, this is the problem um let me just hold on to the question let me enter into number 42 most important this is the key to the whole uh, method of overcoming desire is a central message of sri uh, krishna in this third chapter indriyani paranyahur indriyebhya param mana manasastu para buddhi yo buddhe paratastu sa so it is said that the senses are uh, uh, superior uh, superior than the senses is the mind intellect is superior to the mind um, and beyond the intellect the supreme is the self the atma so senses are superior superior to what it has not been said superior to their objects to the external objects this word the key word here is para para means superior superior in what sense they are subtler sukshma they are inward pratyak and they are more powerful um, higher so compared to the things which you see hear smell taste touch compared to the cookie which i'm going to eat the sensory power of taste is superior to that it is inward also inward in what sense inner to me closer to me the uh, witness the, the consciousness it is the senses are closer to me than the object of the senses and uh, the senses are uh, superior in the sense that there is more uh, intelligence involved in that the object is lower inferior outer physical in this 42nd verse the entire wisdom of the pancha kosha viveka has been put in there shri krishna teaches the pancha kosha viveka to arjuna in 42nd verse pancha kosha viveka the method of discernment of the five sheets five sheets pancha kosha the method of discernment discernment of what discernment of the self from the five layers of the human personality this is you this you find in the taittiriya upanishad in the taittiriya upanishad second chapter the second chapter of the taittiriya upanishad is called brahmananda valli the chapter on the bliss of brahman there um the method of this the discernment of the five sheets pancha kosha viveka five sheet discernment method is is taught what is said there that look at the human personality look at what we consider ourselves to be take a look first most obviously there is the physical body so here is this body um the entire physical body with its um, um you know the organs and tissues and down to the cellular level inner to this is the vital body so the physical body is annamaya kosha the sheath of um a uh, 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 food a food means it's it's made of food what we eat and drink that is converted into this physical body and inner to this para para means inner inner to this is the vital body the pranamaya kosha uh, vital body here means 
the physiological processes which keep this physical body alive breathing digestion uh, circulation uh, the nervous system all the activities together which we call life uh, so these are processes in fact a doctor of course the doctor must study anatomy but the doctor actually studies the processes which are going on in the body to cure a patient to keep a patient alive those processes must continue so the, the this is called pranamaya kosha the entire physiological processes in the human body in, in any living body it is inner inner in what sense one must be careful here the pranamaya kosha that each sheath is inner to the other it does not mean physically inner if you physically go into this body like a doctor may probe into it you will only find uh, more body um, there will be flesh uh, there is the skin if you probe inside you will find uh, the flesh and the the fat and the um, blood vessels and the nervous system and the bones inside that you will find the marrow if you go down microscopically you will find tissue and uh, uh, the cellular system uh, intracellular structures so all the th things you will you will find um, that is physically inside but this is um, this is in the sense of subtle means what is at a more well i can only say subtler level what is supporting this physical system that is closer to you psychologically the pranic system even interior to that para higher than that superior than that interior than that is the mind so here comes the senses and the mind at the level of the pranamaya kosha the vital sheath and the manomaya kosha the sheath of the mind there are the senses uh, the senses and the mind is the manomaya kosha the sheath of the mind where thinking is going on feeling is going on all information from the senses are collated and you get a, a sensation of the world um, directions for acting walking talking eating these are going on so mind inner to that finer than that higher than that is the uh, vigyanamaya kosha the buddhi the the the, the, sen, the sheath of the intellect and beyond that we talk about the anandamaya kosha the sheet of bliss but sri krishna has given a simplified model here he has not gone into that and then beyond that is the atman beyond means subtler than that inner to that is the atman the self all of that is in the taittiriya upanishad um where uh, you find this entire pancha kosha viveka the discernment method of discernment of five sheets but here sri krishna has just given a simpler model consider the world which is higher than that is the sensory system which krishna talked about the five senses and then higher than that higher means inner subtler than that uh, is the mind buddhi and manas and higher uh, subtler inner the inner to that is the buddhi the intellect and higher than that subtler than that inner to that finally highest of all is the atman which is consciousness this structure he has set up this is beautifully explained in kathop upanishad as the with the image of the chariot the image of the chariot so um yama explains to nachiketa yama the lord of death explains to nachiketa the little boy who asked the questions in the kathop upanishad that consider this human system the body mind system to like a chariot and in the chariot the body is the chariot the senses are the horses the senses are there are five horses five powerful horses there are the senses and what what is the road on which these horses are running not a physical journey it is the road is the the sense objects and, uh, they are running they are running towards seeing hearing smelling taste form sound and taste and smell and touch so those are the roads on which they are running and the horses are controlled by the reins the reins are the 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 ropes by which the horses are controlled the reins together are, it's it's called the mind manas senses are horses the, re, uh, the mind is the reins and the reins are in the hands of the charioteer the driver who is the driver buddhi the intellect and then what are you you are neither the horses nor the reins nor even the driver you are the passenger so it's like uber ha huh? you are sitting in there you you are the passenger in, inside and 
you are unconcerned with the functioning of the chariot but the chariot is meant for your purpose to take you on your spiritual journey and the spiritual journey is not from one place to another the spiritual journey is from ignorance to knowledge to yourself actually um um radha krishna and dr radha krishna and said the goal of the spiritual journey is to find ourselves <laughs> so that is the journey now the chariot example is meant to show exactly what krishna is saying here the horses have to be trained they have to be disciplined uh, he says when the horses are well trained and the rain is firmly controlled and controlled by the rain the mind is uh, uh, mindful samanaska and the intellect pragyana one the intellect is full uh, very well read in vedanta and understood everything clarity is there then the chariot is so adhvana param gachyati that means that it reaches the end of the spiritual journey otherwise the chariot comes to disaster so it will, the car will crash if the horses are not controlled one is rushing this way one is rushing that way they are not taking you where you want to go if the reins are loose what is loose rein what is the meaning of that the mind is not mindful nowadays mindfulness is a big big thing uh, exactly that word mindfulness is used in the kathopanishad samanaska literally means mindful focus Contr- uh, attention concentration the mind has to be focused and concentrated able to bring the senses under control and at the level of intellect there must be understanding of vedanta um, pragyana one wisdom must be there here it is being applied to vedanta but just think about it anything that you want to do in life you want to earn a lot of money you want to make it big on broadway you want to become a professor at columbia university or harvard all of them they require the senses to be controlled mind to be mindful focus concentration and the intellect to be full with the wisdom which is necessary for taking you to that goal here of course it means enlightenment the highest goal and this will lead to realization of the self the the passenger in the chariot so here you see indriyani paranyaho the senses are said to be superior to their objects it's not object not mentioned here indriyebhya parambana the mind is superior to the senses superior means inner um in control finer and superior to the mind is the intellect the buddhi and superior to the buddhi that means beyond the buddhi innermost is you the self which is consciousness i think this is what i wanted to say yes let's quickly look at the questions grish Yes. Um, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah. Um, I, I have a basic question that I'm confused about is that uh, going by Vivekananda's uh, uh, poem about uh, which ends in none escape the law. Yeah. The law of karma. Uh, uh, if karma is deterministic. Yes. Um, what is its role in the control of the senses if karma is deterministic it trumps free will and you need free will to to be able to actually control the senses i yes i'm glad you raised this question i was supposed to mention free will by uh, i'd forgotten about it um the very idea that from tasmat tvam indriyanyado niyamya bharatarshaba uh, in the 41st verse krishna says at the very beginning control or discipline the senses here itself he introduces the concept of free will so without free will to bring the con- senses under control control means a discipline this i will see this i will not see this i will eat this i will not eat and so on it requires free will to use the mind to focus think about this and not about that not let the mind scatter be attentive it requires free will and uh, to Uh, clarity at the level of intellect of course so free will is there doesn't karma override it no it does not karma is more like it gives us two things one is the the conditioning of past so certain tendencies certain forces which have been called prakriti here by krishna very powerful um, we flow according to our prakriti this was discussed earlier 
So that conditioning has been created by our past karma. Notice there, we have created. What we are today is the result of what we have done in past lives. So, but at this time it seems deterministic because they are very powerful. They force us along certain grooves of uh, action, desire and thought, feeling also. Uh, but there also, they just are powerful, but we have this window of opportunity. At the most subtle level, desires, thoughts, they float up from our subconscious mind due to our past conditioning into the level of our, our conscious mind. And as they come up, I like this, I want that, I need this. That coming up, we have no control over. That's coming from our past conditioning. But at that moment, we have control. That's where Sri Krishna is saying, catch hold of that moment. And control. Control means, see whether what is coming up, those impulses, should we let them run free? Should we express them? So one idea is that whatever is coming up, it is due to a misunderstanding of, of Freudian psychology in the early 20th century. Whatever is bubbling up, desires and impulses from the subconscious mind, express it. If you don't express it, it will lead to repression. Uh, it will lead to suppression and it will lead to problems in your day-to-day -day life. What Sri Krishna is saying is, when they are the weakest, when these impulses come up, then if you have a high goal in life, spiritual goal of course, but even something else you want to do in life, you will automatically see whether these, if I um, eat that, if I drink that, if I uh, do say these things, will it be a, take me towards my goal or away from it? And skillfully replace positive thinking, uh, positive words and positive actions, re um, use those, uh, replace the negative ones with those. So that, that opportunity is always there, that exercise of free will. Why it is so difficult is, if you miss that window of opportunity. And they are discussed in the Patanjali Yoga Sutras. It's a very small window of opportunity where uh, if you catch it, thought, desire is still weak. If you nip it in the bud and replace it with positive, not all of them, the ones which are negative, you replace them, uh, you can change your life. But if you do not do that, and our default setting is, we are not even aware of what's bubbling up. By the time it's already at the level of the mind, conscious thought, uh, then it's difficult to control. Especially if there are ingrained patterns of behavior, of addiction, of desire, of anger, of uh, negativity, depression. So, uh, that dominates the mind. Then that is expressed in speech and that is expressed in action. So, we have... Uh, yeah. yeah, we have... It's always a, possible to find a window of opportunity that to we, exercise free will over karma. Yes. The window of, according to Sri Krishna, according to Vedanta, the window of yoga also, window of uh, opportunity, that, that gap is always there. Moment to moment, you have the power of taking a decision. The power of taking a decision is, we may fail and the mind tricks us into thinking that, see, you tried, it didn't work. Uh, it is for very disciplined people, not for you. You are a failure. But no, that power has not gone away. Again, the next moment, the power is there. The window of opportunity is there every moment to moment to moment. It's just that we miss that window. By the time we are already nourishing that thought, it has become strong. Then it's very difficult to overcome. You may use willpower to overcome it once, you may you will fail the next two times. Now it is easier said than done. There is a lot of discussion on this. Uh, meditation, for example, what does it do? Calming the mind, focusing the mind, that samanaska, mindfulness, it slows down these mental processes, makes it calm, so that the window of opportunity becomes visible to us. Otherwise, what happens in day-to-day -day life is, first of all, we are not introspective. We are too busy and we immediately snap into the mode of desire or anger or retribution. Um, he said something to me, I lash back by saying this. Um, by the time it's too late, it's very difficult. The, re the real reason is, not the lack of knowledge, it, it is that uh, samanaska, that mindfulness is lacking. So the opportunity to exercise free will has passed. Yes. Um, all this, but it's a good point, all this is predicated upon the existence of free will. This would make no sense at all if we did not have that much free will to make a beginning in this path. Um, I have given this example earlier also. 
the yogi's mind and the worldly person's mind. I, I told you about this experience I had in uh, um, in Gangotri, where I would sit on the bank of the Ganga. This was in uh, August, I think. So after the rainy season, lot of um, uh, lot of rainwater there and muddy water. So one sadhu sat next to me and told me, "Look at this river, uh, the Ganga, that Bhagirathi there. Uh, it is." This is the difference between a yogi's mind and a worldly person's mind. What is the difference? It is four things. First, if you come in winter, you will see the same river in a different form. It's mostly chunks of ice. Now you see there is a lot of water. At that time, there will be less. Most of it is frozen. Similarly, in the worldly person's mind, a lot of restlessness. Thoughts, emotions, desires coming and going, changing. Whereas a yogi's mind, only the deliberately selected ones are there. So it's much calmer. Then uh, he says, look at this water. It's turbulent. It's muddy actually at that time. It's full of uh, landslides are there. So the water is brownish. But he says, if you come in uh, winter, he says, he said in Hindi, you can see, you can throw a, a coin into the river, the water is so clear like glass. If you look down, there's a wooden bridge. If you look down from the bridge, you can read up the denomination of the coin also. It's so clear. He says the worldly mind is turbulent and full of uh, impurity, whereas the yogi's mind is clear, tra uh, transparent. Third, he said the worldly mind is dangerous. He says this river is rushing with so much water, if you step into it, you'll be swept away. Actually, somebody had been killed the earlier day. Uh, similarly, the uh, mind of the worldly person, turbulent, suddenly something comes up, bursts into anger, into depression, commits suicide, terrible. It can make you do anything and then you regret it later. The, the very, uh, of course, if you commit suicide, you did not much chance of regretting it later. But uh, if, you see, the very fact that we feel guilty and we regret certain things, why did I do that? Why did I say that? Why did I even think that? It shows that our mind is not under control. Sometimes we do things which later the same mind regrets it. So that is the mind of the worldly person. And he says, when you come uh, to in winter, if you see the mind, uh, if you see this river, it is there's so little water you can easily walk across it. Uh, you can w enter into the river and walk across to the other shore. It is not at all dangerous to you. Similarly, yogi's mind is not dangerous. And the fourth one he said was. This water you cannot drink yourself, you cannot offer to anybody. You, he said, ye, ye, that means it's uh, full of sediment at that time. But he says, you come in winter, you take the water, it is um, sweet and cool and pleasing, you can drink it yourself and you can give it to others also. Similarly, the mind, the worldly mind, it gives you no peace and people around you also will not be in peace because of you, <laughs> of the worldly mind. But the yogi's mind, when you have a, yogi, a yogi's mind, it gives you peace and it radiates peace all around you. This I have seen in, in um, senior monks, advanced spiritual seekers. There's so much at peace and joy and serenity. And you, you catch it also when you are in their company. Okay. Let me just read the last one. Evam buddhe param buddhva sangstabhyatmanam atmana Jahi Shatrum Maha Baho Kama Rupam Durasadam Thus knowing the self as superior to the intellect and becoming established in the self. Established in self means I am Brahman. From this attitude, with this paradigm, conquer desire. Which is very difficult to comprehend. The ways of desire are very difficult to comprehend. I think whole of Freudian psychoanalysis is in this phrase, Kama Rupam Durasadam, the incomprehensible nature of desire. But that can be overcome when you realize yourself as the self and from that perspective you deal with the uh, sensory, mental and intellect system. What it means, we will investigate it a little further next time before we move on to chapter 4. Any last comment? Rick said that uh, is asking which of the koshas does the subtle body which reincarnates include. So the koshas, the only the annamaya kosha, physical body is destroyed uh, at uh, death, and uh, 
ది ప్రాణమయ కోశ మనోమయ కోశ విజ్ఞానమయ కోశ అండ్ ది ఆనందమయ కోశ ఆల్ ఆఫ్ దీస్ ఆర్ దే దే ఆర్ పార్ట్ ఆఫ్ ది కాజల్ బాడీ అండ్ సటిల్ బాడీ విచ్ ట్రాన్స్ మైగ్రేట్ టు అదర్ అదర్ లైఫ్స్ ఆత్మన్ ఈజ్ ఆఫ్ కోర్స్ ఫ్రమ్ అన్ అద్వైతిక పర్స్పెక్టివ్ ఈజ్ ఆల్ పర్ వెయిడింగ్ బ్రహ్మన్ యస్ in between state <coughs> i guess so because uh, it depends on what that in between state is there are some in between states which are um brutish that means animalish where free will is not possible this is one big difference between animals and uh, human beings spiritual life is possible for us because that degree of free will that window of opportunity is there for us it's not there for for animals uh, they they cannot exercise that uh, that that freedom degree of freedom is not there um that's the, that also holds for in between states from death to rebirth depending on which loka we are lucky or unlike unlucky enough to be in spiritual practice may or may not be possible is it called emotional intelligence it's not emotional intelligence though emotional intelligence is a modern way of putting it it's um, um it is a sign of self mastery actually so emotional intelligence you know it has become daniel Go- goleman popularized the term so eq the term of uh, emotional quotient emotional intelligence it includes uh, one of the central features of emotional intelligence is impulse control so the senses want something immediately i will do it are you able to control it at that level that's one of the uh, components five components one component is that one let's uh, s- stop here and we will pick it up i, w- I will uh, send you the links for the patanjali yoga sutra class which is going to start next week those who are interested you can attend and we will meet again శాంతిశాంతిమకృష్ణారుపణమస్తు ఆల్ రైట్ సో లెట్ మీ సీ ఆల్ ఆఫ్ యూ బిఫోర్ వి ఆల్ డిసప్పియర్ నమస్కార్ నమస్కార్ టేక్ కేర్ టెల్ బీ మీట్ అగైన్ టేక్ కేర్ Thank you. Thank you. I want to. I want to. I want to. I want to.